And today I'm gonna to be sharing some recent research on foliar fertilizers in soybean. I'm gonna start with all the thank yous so that we make sure we make time for them. Uh, two of the core team members are here with me today, Dr. Laura Lindsay and Dr. Rachel Van, as well as my advisor, Sean Conley, uh, the bean team for helping spray plots here in Wisconsin and all of our collaborators. As you'll see, this study took place in many states and that's not possible without a great group of people to work with. Uh, this trial took place in 2019 and 2020, and it looked at prophylactic nutrient application. So this means we were applying foliar fertilizers before there was any evidence of visual, uh, visual evidence of nutrient deficiency. And it looked at nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and a variety of micronutrients. We had some dry products and some liquid products, and all products were sprayed at R3 to coincide with fungicide and insecticide applications. We have 46 sites in 16 states, covering the majority of the Eastern US. Uh, our lowest yielding site was around 30 bushels per acre on average, and our highest yielding site was in Arlington, Wisconsin with around 85 bushels per acre. Uh, so we just had a great variety of growing environments and yield environments included in this study. It was a multi-site randomized complete block design. Most sites had six replications, some had five or eight, and uh, we had six different products and one untreated control, so seven different treatments in this trial. Uh, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this table, but I wanted to point out that a lot of the products in this trial had a macronutrient in them and a micronutrient component. But some had just micros and some had just mi macros. And overall, the application rate for the nutrients was quite low. So Fertorain applied three and a half pounds per acre of nitrogen, but most of the nutrients were applied at under a pound per acre application rate. And that's pretty typical of nutrient products, of uh, foliar nutrient products. Uh, we also took some other in-season measurements, including uh, soil testing each replication so that we could see if any of our sites were below the critical level for P or K because we would expect those sites to have a higher response. And we also took um, tissue samples within each plot so that we could see how the leaves themselves changed before and after application. Uh, here are some results. I'm gonna share this as a box plot today and our control is here on the left side. And the dark line in the middle of each, plot, of each box is the median yield for each treatment. The edges of the box are the first and third quartile of yield. And you can see that all of the boxes kind of generally line up with each other, which indicates that there's not much of a difference in yield between treatments. This is averaged across all of our sites. And all of the boxes are roughly the same size, which tells me that there's also very similar variation in yield across our treatments but none of the boxes are identical to the control box. So we were going to run some stats to make sure that the differences we're seeing between the different boxes in the box plot are not actually meaningful. Uh, so in order to do that, we ran an ANOVA. This is a very common statistical test for randomized complete block design small plot trials. And it was a mixed model ANOVA with replication as a random factor and a Kenward Rogers approximation for degrees of freedom. I'm only pointing these two things out because they change how the ANOVA table looks. It doesn't change our interpretation of the ANOVA table because we're still going to use the F and P value for that. I think it's important to point out because this ANOVA table may look different from others you see during these presentations. Uh, so when the p-value is below 0.05, we would consider that to be a significant difference. So here for site year, this middle row, the p-value is below 0.05, and that's to be expected. We did this research in 16 states, and we would expect to see a significant difference in yield between site years. Uh, we also have the treatment and the treatment by site year interaction, and the p-values for those are much higher. Uh, above 0.05. So we would say that there is not a significant difference in yield between treatment or the combination of treatment and site year. And this is really important because it shows that in our study, we are not seeing a benefit to prophylactic nutrient application because it overall averaged across all of the site years, 
there wasn't an increase in yield associated with any of the treatments on their own. And then there's not an interaction. So we're not seeing that at some of the sites, there's a difference in how the treatments are responding. Uh, so that's, that's the core of our argument here is that there's not a significant difference in yield between foliar nutrient products. Uh, but I get this question a lot. We only tested six products in 46 environments. So how can we trust these results? Uh, this is a great question. And uh, we can't test every product. That's just not feasible. So many products come out every year. But we were able to compare our results to the past 30 years of foliar nutrient studies and saw that they're actually really similar. So we, we trust these results a lot. In Iowa in the 1990s, they had a 26 site year trial looking at uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and sulfur foliar products. And only three of the 26 sites were responsive. So this means that at 23 out of 26 sites, the yield was the same in the unfertilized and fertilized plots. Michigan has also had a pretty extensive series of foliar nutrient studies over the last 10 years. In 117 site years of trials, looking at different combinations of nutrients in prophylactic uh, nutrients, they only had nine responsive sites. So again, there are other sites, other studies in our region seeing really similar results across a broader range of foliar nutrient products. Uh, so as new products come out, uh, there are a couple different things you can think about because we're not seeing a consistent trend where prophylactic nutrients seem to make a lot of sense. Are you seeing trial results that took place over multiple years and multiple sites? This is really important because if you're just seeing one site year, it might be cherry picked. There can be random factors that cause a single site year to have an increase in yield related to a certain treatment. But if you can see over many different site years, you know that those are results that are more likely to hold when you try this on your own farm. And can you get information from someone who isn't selling the product? Maybe there's been a trial done by your local county extension, maybe you have a friend that ran a strip trial a few years ago, but just try and vary those sources of information when you're looking at new products. And can you try the product on some test strips on your own farm before you try it at a larger scale? I know Ohio State has a lot of great extension people, including two here with us today. And many of your county extension agents and some of the people at the state level would love to help you set up your own on-farm strip trials and determine where to test these products and help you make sense of that data at the end of the growing season. Now, this is a great way to test a product before you decide to spend all your money on it for your whole farm up front. Uh, with that, these are some references for the Michigan and Iowa studies I shared, as well as my contact information. Uh, you're welcome to email me with any questions. Thanks, Emma. I appreciate the summary, and it's been really fun to be involved in this project. Um, I think it's really interesting to have such a just a wide diversity of these locations, yields, and environments. Um, and I always think it's good to remind farmers to really think about these products, whether it's a foliar fertilizer or a fungicide or insecticide or anything. Is you know, do I have that yield limitation on my farm? Um, and there are cases where micronutrients are needed. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about any of those specific cases, and it's of course not widespread, but there are specific cases where where micronutrients would be necessary. Yeah, I think about it as manganese in Ohio. So mm -hmm. one of your past students, uh, Grace Looker, has done some work on this in Ohio, and we see it in Michigan as well, where on those sandy soils, sometimes manganese is limiting, but using manganese foliar fertilizer prophylactically on those mm -hmm. sites doesn't increase yield. Yeah, so it's, you know, knowing what, what's that little yield limitation in, in your field. Um, I don't know, Steve, you've done some work on micronutrients in Ohio. What have you seen? Yeah, we've uh, seen results very consistent with this. We actually, the, we didn't have, um, we really just ran for a couple years in a probably a, a dozen sites or something like that. And we, we weren't un unable to detect from a kind of a general, there was about five micronutrients in kind of a, a, a blended product. We just tested one product and um, we did not find any, any positive response to yield. So, um, 
I have a question for Emma, if, uh, if that's okay. So, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that we talk about too, uh, in this, in regards to foliar fertilization is, you know, and just in general with any time we're talking about it, making a decision about should we pull the trigger and uh, make an additional application or invest in a product. And that's the issue of kind of cost versus, you know, versus return and this idea of ROI and um, what it's going to be. That question, you know, you, you, you're you presented, of course, just um, yield data and looking at kind of statistically significant yield responses. But then, you know, from a growing perspective or grower's perspective, taking it one step further and thinking about profitability, you might, there's a chance, of course, of getting a yield increase, but still that um, that product not actually paying for itself, right? That application. Um, and so I didn't know, Emma, if you had anything to say in terms of like, you know, these six treatments and like what they might cost or what it, if you have any kind of range in terms of what it, um, what you actually need, how many bushels you might need to actually see, um, to have that, that management actually pay for itself. So I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so the products in our trial cost between $4 and $20 per acre, which is on the lower end of foliar products overall. Uh, and you're going to need two to three bushels to pay for it, for the product itself, assuming that you're going to make a pass and apply a fungicide or an insecticide anyway the number of bushels you need to pay for it goes up if you're not already driving across your field. And every time you drive across your field after R1, you do risk losing yield just from plant damage on its own. Uh, so just be cautious if you're going to add in this product, because even if you're making a pass anyway, you need a few bushels to pay for the product. Um, a lot of salespeople recommend combining products. So you're then looking at, you know, two or three foliar products in the tank. Then you need, you know, six bushels to pay for the cost of the product. And that is still assuming that you're making a pass anyway. If you're making a pass just for a foliar nutrient product, you're not going to be driving across that field anyway. I honestly think that the, the risk is way too high. I think you're more likely to lower your yield by making that pass as opposed to raise it and certainly lower your profit. Mm -hmm.